Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to Outline for a Tomb, poem number 12 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets. Um, well, in earlier lectures, we pointed out that Autumn has uh, uh, the ability to, to symbolize the old rivulets, the new. This is a tribute poem to the great George Peabody, one of the great philanthropists in American history. Many have argued that he is the originator of the very idea of philanthropy, and we'll have more to say about that in a moment. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Waldar Playlist. Everything from inscriptions up to and including an introductory set of comments to Autumn Rivulets, and we just finished with Lilac's Time. Now, our Nortons that we like to refer to to give us some background information tells us that this poem was first published in the Galaxy January 1870 under the title Brother of All with Generous Hand. It was reprinted in Passage to India in 1871, in the Passage to India group of Leaves of Grass in 1872, and, uh, and finally in 1881 under its present title with 30 of its 79 lines canceled. Now the millionaire that's being referenced, as we just said, is George Peabody, 1795 to 1869, philanthropist who died in London November 4th, 1869. And in fact, the English, this is how revered he was in England, they wanted to bury him in, in Westminster, in the Abbey there, and uh, he said no, he wanted to be buried back in the United States. His body was returned by British warship to his native Danvers, Massachusetts, which was the last words that he said as he died. He wanted to be sure he was buried in Danvers as opposed to being buried in London. Uh, in January of 1870, he founded the Peabody Museums at Yale and Harvard, along with a whole bunch of other types of uh, philanthropy activities. I do want you to, uh, or challenge you, to do a little bit of uh, research on your own of this great American, this great philanthropist who started out in poverty with absolutely nothing. It's one of the great American stories. Whitman, of course, is going to celebrate that in Outlines for a Tomb. Notice this is a three-part poem that we will now work with together. We'll begin, uh, notice, with a series of two kind of rhetorical questions. What may we chant, O thou, within this tomb? Notice it's a we, right? What tablets, outlines, hang for thee, O millionaire? Now, it's possible that we could read the first two lines as satiric. That is to say, we're going to say something negative about this millionaire. By the way, you'll see the subtitle as GP for George Peabody, buried 1870. The life thou livest, we know not. Now that we here is fascinating. Is he talking about Americans? Is he talking about normal people? Is he talking about the poor? It's interesting the we that Whitman is uh, speaking for here. The life thou livest, we know not, but that thou walkest thy years in barter amid the haunts of brokers, nor heroism thine, nor war, nor glory. It isn't altogether clear in the first section that Whitman is in fact outright celebrating Peabody. He is going to say that he spent his time, of course, in bartering. The use of the word haunts, of course, will give a possible negative inclination for brokers. And the fact that heroism in war and glory, in other words, he wasn't a famous warrior or anything like that. But now to passage number two, in the beginning, of course, of the celebration. And the celebration is powerful. It's powerful for Whitman. The celebration is going to focus predominantly on what Peabody did for the we that is mentioned here in the first stanza. Silent, he says, my soul, with drooping lids as waiting pondered, turning from all the samples, monuments of heroes. Monuments of heroes, by the way, is a phrase that's only used one time in Leaves of Grass. It's right here. While through the interior vistas, noiseless uprose phantasmic, and then in parenthetics, as by night auroras of the north, Lambent tableaus, prophetic bodily, uh, uh, um, bodiless senses, spiritual projections. You'll uh, remember this uh, term tablo uh, tableaus from City of Origins, uh, of Orgies, by the way. And prophetic, you'll remember from starting from Pomenoc Passage 10, spiritual projections. In other words, this is going to be a poem about spiritual projections. And then he will begin to remind Americans and of course English as well, what it is that Peabody did and what he represented in his philanthropy. Six times we're going to get the phrase in one. In one, as in one 
projection, spiritual projection. In one, among the city streets, a laborer's home appeared. After his day's work done, cleanly, sweet aired, that's key, right? Because Peabody was already one that was very interested and concerned about pollution. Sweet aired, the gaslight burning, the carpet swept in a fire in the cheerful stove. In other words, the fact that workers and laborers had a place to live that's clean and provided for. And now the second, in one, the sacred paturation scene, a happy, painless mother per, uh, birthed a perfect child. In other words, Peabody was concerned about the health of especially laborers. And now the third, in one, a bounteous morning meal set peaceful parents with contented sons. The idea that everyone should have something to eat. The idea that laborers should not starve, should not live in depraved uh, conditions, uh, especially in regards to their diet. Number four, in one by twos and threes, Young people, Peabody's so concerned with the young and their education. Hundreds concentrating walked the paths and streets and roads toward a tall domed school. The idea that everyone should be educated, not just the wealthy, not just the elite. And now to, uh, to the fifth of these uh, spiritual projections. In one, a trio, beautiful, grandmother, loving daughter, loving daughter's daughter, sat chatting and sewing. In other words, the idea is that Peabody was concerned with not just males, but as well females, and especially those of the labor uh, um, class, right? And then finally, at number six, in one, along a suit of noble rooms, and of course these schools and libraries Peabody's so famous for, mid plenteous books and journals, paintings on the walls, fine statuettes where groups of friendly journeymen, mechanics, young and old, reading, conversing. In some ways, it's a return to Dante's, you'll remember, Limbo. We've talked about it at LearnStrong.net elsewhere. That in Limbo, you'll remember that they sit at their ease, the greatest thinkers and philosophers, and they can converse. And here, this was kind of the Peabody vision, that laborers would not be defined simply as workers, but they would be intellectuals, and they could be thinkers, and they could be trained in schools and the like. He uses the word all twice. All all the shows of laboring life, city and country, men, uh, women's, men's and children's, their wants provided for, hewed in the sun and tinged for once with joy. Of course, that for once is quite ironic, right? Marriage, the street, the factory, farm, the house room, lodging room, labor and toll, the bath, gymnasium, playground, obviously Peabody responsible for so much of this, Library, of course, that's that reading and conversing that was mentioned earlier. College, the student, boy or girl, led forward to be taught. And, and, and I said to you guys in early lectures uh, that Whitman as teacher, I think it was his first love. I don't think he ever left it. And I think he understood that a democracy is only as great as its education. Only. And if you're educating everybody and you're doing it well, you'll have one kind of democracy. If you are not doing that well, you're going to have a different understanding of democracy, and ultimately it won't be a democracy. And here, notice, you've got the student, the boy or the girl, led forward to be taught, the idea of pedagogy to lead children, and then go back to our comments on Song of Myself passage 46 and 47, which in my argument is one of the hearts of reading Leaves of Grass, as we said when we saw it. The sick care for, the, uh, the idea of hospitals and the like, of course. The shoeless shod. The orphan fathered and mothered, obviously, what do you do with the children that nobody wants? Go back to our comments on Swift's modest proposal. What do you do with all the children in the world that nobody wants? That's going to be the standard whereby we decide whether we are in fact civilized or not. And obviously, Whitman celebrating Peabody's reminding us of this constantly during his lifetime. The hungry fed, the houseless housed, and then in parenthetics, the intentions, perfect and divine, the workings, details, happily human. In other words, it was his argument, Whitman's, that Peabody got it, that he understood that the most important thing that we can ever do for our laboring class is to celebrate them as human, as human. And in that humane view, obviously, he will celebrate Peabody as one of the great ones. And now he'll speak directly to Peabody for all Americans. Oh, thou within this tomb, from these such scenes, thou stintless, lavish giver. Tallying a word, of course, that he loves, and Harold Bloom's made a whole lot about this word when we commented on it elsewhere. Tallying the gifts of earth, large is the earth. Thy name on earth with mountains, fields, and tides. I love that he ties Peabody's name and memory to nature. Emerson would have approved, obviously. Now, oh, I'm sorry, nor, 
by your streams alone. Again, this use of nature language is powerful. You rivers, we're back to autumn rivulets, obviously. By you, and we're getting to three of these, the by you's, right? Um, actually four, but three to start lines by uh, the anaphoria. By you, your banks, Connecticut. And of course, I love that he uses the word rivers and he talks about banks, and rivers do have banks. And of course, he's talking about the banks that obviously Peabody was uh, so influential with and around. By you, your banks, Connecticut, by you, and all your teeming life, O Thames. Again, he dies in London, but wants to you know, be buried again uh, back home. By you, Potomac, laving the ground, Washington trot. I love that he goes back to Washington. By you, Patapsco, you, Hudson, you, endless Mississippi, naming of rivers, right? Nor you alone, but to the high seas, against autumn rivulets, the river runs to the sea. High seas launch, my thought. His memory. It's interesting syntax. It kind of meanders the way rivers would, and we pointed out, obviously, at 2B before, how Whitman loves to play this game. What are we going to say at 2A? Well, I think this is, of course, a reminder that Whitman, as a great American, understood great Americans like Peabody, and he wanted to celebrate them. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime is that line, of course, from Longfellow's Psalm of Life. And I think Whitman would definitely argue that Peabody was one of those lives of great men worthy of emulation. And to be, I love the, the repetitive six times in one, in one, in one. I love the idea that he uses this word picture of the river and he talks about banks. And he, we can talk about the banks of the river in nature and we can talk about banks themselves, right? At 3A, Obviously, the tribute, the tribute poems elsewhere in Leaves of Grass do come to mind um, when we were messing around with uh, certain country tetsi as well as Singer in Prison just a couple of poems ago. Of course, Lilacs and Oh Captain, My Captain, those great poems of tribute for Lincoln. As we look at Whitman's life in his biography, there's a number of people he's very impressioned by. Obviously, Washington comes to mind as well. He sees great Americans as being worthy of celebration. They don't all have to be famous, but they have to be worthy of celebration because what? What's his word? Human. Humane, right? Finally, at 3B, for you, how are you going to own a poem like this? What are, what are your thoughts about, about charity, about philanthropy, and the ways in which philanthropy now is and charity and charitable donations um, is, is being discussed and talked about in any number of ways. And, and, and uh, where do you kind of come down on that? And for you, who is worthy of this kind of celebration as a philanthropist in your, in your own mind? And who's the most charitable person that you've ever known worthy of celebration? Thank you.